We'll have a copy ready. There's always someone uh, having to sign in. Thanks everyone for attending. It's a great, uh, great attendance turnout tonight. Once again, we thank the RFS for providing this great facility to us. Um, we'll take our collection on the way out. <laughs> Speaking of collection, thanks. <coughs> if you're not a member, there is a $10 fee. Uh, the man to see is our secretary over here, Bob Mackay. Please, if you would go and. Okay. Uh, and, and if you're not a member, please consider joining and uh, if you see the benefits in it for your professional qualifications. Can I throw something in? If, if you're not a member, join now. Join now. And we'll waive your $10. There you go. There you go. You can't beat that. It's a Christmas special. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're, we're, um, first of all, let me introduce uh, Tim Ryan. He's a fire and rescue New South Wales fiery. He's had, he's had 14 years in the job. 11 operational and the last three he's been an instructor. So he's kindly come, agreed to come and uh, give us a, a talk on back to basics, which uh, I think a lot of us are sure <coughs> we know. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions made here tonight that we'll realise that uh, we're incorrect. Um, as you, you probably know, under NFPA uh, 1033, you might not know this, 1.3.7, uh, fire investigators are expected to have an up-to-date basic knowledge of fire chemistry better than the high school level. So, um, Tim, do you think you're up to that bit on the high school level? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. we'll see. And uh, at the end of the, we, I want to, at the end of the, <coughs> the talk, I think it goes for about approximately an hour and a half? Yeah, an hour and a half, thereabouts. So I haven't timed but so. Okay. We're discussing maybe yes. inviting the final education night of the year, so this time next year, with a bit of a social event and, uh, and a, a, a sort of... Um, <laughs> Nothing too outrageous. Yeah, we'll <laughs> Sorry, okay, that's, that's, that's the introduction. Um, Tim, over to you, mate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Forbes, for inviting me to do this. Look, well, well, I wasn't well. expecting a big crowd like this, like a stadium gig. I'm used to doing dingy little pubs, you know, four people in the crowd. So I'm very nervous. Uh, if I crash and burn tonight, it won't be because of lack of preparation. Okay, it'll be nerves. It'll be spontaneous combustion. <laughs> <laughs> spontaneous combustion. Uh, look, I'm going to start off tonight. This is something I put together um, to explain to myself the reason that we gas cool, okay, when we enter a structure fire and we're moving through those rooms that are filled with uh, gases and smoke that are coming off that fire and they're full of energy. Why we gas cool and why uh, that gas, uh, gas cooling is so effective. This is how I explain it to myself. I'll uh, we'll start off with matter. Might seem a funny place to start, but bear with me. Uh, three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And all matter is made up of particles. Molecules made up of atoms, made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, and those particles are in constant motion. And that motion gives my particles kinetic energy. Okay, the faster my particles move, the more kinetic energy. The slower they move, the less kinetic energy. Kinetic energy can be passed on from particle to particle, okay? With faster moving particles, passing energy on to slower moving particles. And in those collisions, my faster moving particles, they lose kinetic energy, they slow down. My slower moving particles, they gain kinetic energy and they accelerate. If we look at the motion of our particles, that's also what we base temperature on. Temperature is an average measurement of the movement of the particles within a system. Okay, and a system is whatever we define it as. Uh, could be the particles that make up the water in a glass could be the particles that make up the air in this room. If we want a temperature of the air in this room, we're looking for an average of the movement of those particles, okay? That's what we base degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit or Kelvin on. Temperature is an average of the movement of those particles. 
the faster my particles move, the higher that average is going to be, the higher the temperature. The slower those particles move, the lower the average, the lower the temperature. So if you look at that uh, movement of kinetic energy from fast moving particles to slower moving particles, it also stands to reason that that movement of energy is from areas of higher temperature to areas of lower temperature. Because fast moving particles, higher average, higher temperature. Slower moving particles, lower average, lower temperature. Okay, so that movement of kinetic energy is from areas of higher temperature to lower temperature, or to put it more simply, from hot to cold. And that's a pretty basic principle to uh, remember. The motion of particles. also generate, generates a couple of forms of energy. Thermal energy. And electromagnetic. Radiation. So let's have a look at thermal energy first. Thermal energy is what we also know as heat. Because heat is a measurement of thermal energy moving from one system to another system. And those systems, again, are whatever we define them as. Uh, it could be a chair burning and the energy being released into the surrounding atmosphere. Uh, it could be a glass of water and an ice cube. That movement of energy is from hot to cold. So if we look at system A being a glass of water and system B being an ice cube, I place my ice cube in that water, immediately the fast moving particles in my water begin to collide with and pass energy onto the slower moving particles in my ice. My water particles begin to slow down. My ice particles begin to accelerate. They're taking on kinetic energy. Uh, as my ice particles accelerate, they begin to move around faster. If they take on enough energy, the bond that holds them together in that solid state as ice will be broken and my ice will begin to melt. The greater the, uh, the, greater the uh, temperature difference between my two systems, the greater the rate of energy transfer. If I now have a glass of very hot water, okay, and I place my ice cube in that water, now those water particles are moving far more rapidly. When they collide with and pass energy onto my slow moving ice particles, they pass on a lot more energy. My ice particles accelerate a lot quicker, temperature of my ice increases a lot quicker, and it will melt a lot quicker. So that's thermal energy. Electromagnetic radiation, a little bit different. It's energy that travels in a waveform. And the length of that waveform is determined by what form of radiation it is. OK, and where on the spectrum it lies. It sounds complicated, but it's not really, OK? Ultraviolet radiation. Visible light is radiation. Uh, infrared radiation. It also includes gamma radiation, X-rays, radio waves, microwaves. All energy travelling in a waveform, and that energy is carried by particles called photons. Photons differ from the particles that make up our solid, liquid and gas, okay? But they can interact with and pass energy onto those particles. It's like if I go out in the sun, uh, the sunlight falls on my skin, the photons collide with the atoms that make up the surface of my skin, the atoms begin to move faster, my temperature, the temperature of my skin increases. I feel warmer, I feel hot. Uh, if we look at a fire, electromagnetic radiation, we're usually referring to it as thermal radiation or radiant heat. But I don't really like that term radiant heat because unlike thermal energy, which we know, as, know of as heat, 
it doesn't move from hot to cold, okay? My radiation can move from hot to cold to hot again. Okay, from uh, the intense heat of the sun through the cold vacuum of space back into the warmth of Earth's atmosphere, okay? It doesn't follow the same rules as thermal energy. Uh, if we look at the energy that is present in uh, the radiation that's present in a fire, we have some visible light produced during our flame chemical reaction. But we also have a lot of infrared. A lot of infrared radiation. We can't see it with the naked eye, but that is what we see through our thermal imaging camera. If I look through my thermal imaging camera at areas of lower temperature, my particles are moving slower, there'll be less infrared radiation being generated. Those areas will appear darker on my thermal imaging uh, screen, camera screen. If I look at areas of higher temperature, particles are moving faster, more infrared uh, radiation being generated, they will appear lighter on my thermal imaging camera screen. That's why if I go into an area and I look around and everything's at a similar temperature in that area and I look through my thermal imaging camera, I won't get much contrast in my image, okay? Because all those particles moving at a similar rate and they're all releasing or generating a similar amount of infra infrared radiation. So my image will tend to white out. Uh, unlike thermal energy that requires a medium to travel through, okay? So in a solid, that thermal energy is uh, passed on by conduction. In a liquid and gas, it's being passed on through uh, convection. Radiation doesn't require a medium to travel through, okay? As demonstrated by the sun's uh, radiation passing through that vacuum of space. So let's just go over that again. The motion of my particles, the faster my particles move, the higher the amount of kinetic energy, the higher the temperature the more thermal energy and the more radiation is going to be being generated, okay? So if we look at this being the uh, gases and the smoke being uh, moving around a structure during a structure fire, okay? Moving through those compartments that I'm moving through to get to the compartment where the fire is so I can put water on it. It becomes important that I control those conditions, okay? I want to try and lower temperature. I want to try and lower the amount of thermal uh, energy and the amount of radiation present. Okay, so how do I do that? What I want to do, the uh, gases and the smoke are full of highly energised, fast moving particles, okay? They're uh, carrying a lot of energy from that combustion process. I want to slow those particles down. I want to rob them of some, kin some kinetic energy. If I can slow them down, I'm going to lower temperatures, lower the amount of thermal energy and the amount of radiation being generated. But how do I do that? Energy uh, can be neither created nor destroyed, okay? I can convert it from one form to another, electrical energy into visible light. I can burn petrol, convert chemical energy into mechanical energy to drive my car. But that's a little bit impractical as I'm making my way through as a firefighter. So what I want to do is move that energy from faster moving particles to slower moving particles. I want to introduce a lot of slow moving particles up amongst my fast moving particles that make up my gas and my smoke. And what I have available to use is water. Uh, my water is probably 15 degrees, 20 degrees, full of lots of slow moving particles. So now I want to encourage collisions between my fast moving particles making up my gases and my smoke, and the slow moving particles that make up my water. Okay, I want to maximise surface area. If I can maximise the surface area of my water, I'm going to maximise that interaction 
uh, between those fast moving particles and my slow moving particles. If I use a, a jet of water, it's very ineffective because it's only the outside of my jet that is exposed to those fast moving particles that make up my gas and my smoke. Not a lot of collisions are taking place, okay? Not a lot of energy transfer. Most of my water is wasted. What about, though, if I introduce my water in droplet forms? In droplet form. Lots and lots of small water droplets, okay? Each water droplet is a sphere of water. Well, that's not really a sphere, it's a circle. But imagine that that is a sphere, okay? A a round ball of water. Lots and lots of surface area, lots and lots of slow moving particles exposed to the fast moving particles that make up my gas and my smoke. Lots of opportunity for that energy transfer to take place. A couple of techniques we use uh, or we teach out of fire training, our short pulse, uh, which is to cool the area directly around us and a long pulse where we're putting our water droplets out in front of us, cooling that area where we're moving into. I'll show you a couple of videos uh, in a moment. My short pulse on a 38 millimetre branch flow rate setting of 115 litres per minute and a pressure of 700 kPa. A short sharp movement on the branch, rapidly open and rapidly shut, shutting that branch, okay? Holding the branch up nice and high, about a 45 degree angle, cone angle, will produce a water droplet of about 0.3 to 0.4 of a millimetre in diameter. A multitude of tiny little spheres of water now up amongst that gas and that smoke. Okay, lots of opportunity for that energy transfer to take place. That kinetic energy is passed into my slow moving particles. They accelerate my fast moving particles that make up my gas and my smoke. They slow <coughs> down. Temperature drops. Thermal energy and radiation decreases as well. So I'm keeping my, myself safe while I move through those compartments and move towards that uh, fire. So that's why water droplets are very, very effective as a gas cooling uh, agent. Everyone sort of understand that? I haven't uh, confused anyone too much. Okay, I'll show you a couple of videos uh, when I get over there in a moment, just uh, to demonstrate what a short pulse and a uh, long pulse are. Okay, so that's the first bit of the presentation. Uh, we'll just go through a few units that we'll be talking about today. Uh, thermal energy or any type of energy. The unit is the joule. Okay, 1,000 joules equals a kilojoule, 1,000 kilojoules equals a megajoule. But when we look at that movement of thermal energy, heat, okay, from one system to another, you know, as firefighters, we're usually talking about the energy being released by a fire as it burns and the energy moving into the surrounding atmosphere. And we like to know how much energy is being released over time. We measure that energy in joules per second. And one joule per second is equal to one watt. The watt is the unit of heat release rate. Okay, 1,000 watts equals a kilowatt, 1,000 kilowatts equals a megawatt. Uh, to give you an example, a couple of examples, a uh, smouldering cigarette, about uh, 5 watts of energy, so 5 joules per second of energy being released. A waste paper basket, full of waste paper obviously, uh, paper burns quite rapidly, fairly high heat release rate, about 150 kilowatts, so 150,000 joules per second. Uh, we jump up to, say, a living or bedroom fire, okay? Now we're talking megawatts, uh, 3 to 10 megawatts, depending on ventilation. Why do you think it's depending on ventilation? 
Oxygen, yeah. Oxygen has a big impact on uh, temperatures and heat release rates, and we'll examine that a bit now. So any questions on that? Okay, cool. Give me a moment and I'll erase it. <coughs> Okay, the fire triangle, heat, fuel, and oxygen. And we know that we need those three components present in sufficient quantities for combustion to occur and for combustion to continue. Uh, let's have a look at our fuel first, okay, our modern fuels. Uh, our modern furnishings, we talk about them being uh, synthetic or hydrocarbon based. Organic fuels, any plant or animal based fuel. But it also includes all our fossil fuels. So coal, natural gas and crude oil and if we look at crude oil crude oil undergoes a distillation process okay where we draw off our various grades of fuel about the same point that we pull off our car fuel they pull off the basic components for our plastics And our plastics include all our modern uh, synthetic uh, materials that our furnishings are made out of. Nylon, polyesters, foams, uh, urethanes, uh, PVCs. They're all basically made from uh, crude oil. We know them as synthetics. But we also refer to them as hydrocarbon based. Anyone want to hazard a guess at why we call them hydrocarbon based? They're, bas they're basically made out of hydrogen and carbon atoms, okay? The, the, greater, the greater part of their structure consists of hydrogen and carbon atoms. Okay, they're made out of crude oil. It's basically the same consistency as crude oil is, <coughs> just with the atoms rearranged a little bit. Uh, that's why our... Uh, our modern materials burn so rapidly and with such high heat release rates, so, all right? It's why time to flash over now is three to four minutes. Everyone know what flash over is? Yeah. Uh, three to four minutes, okay? Back in the 70s, it was 17 and a half minutes. Uh, fire Rescue, uh, we used to operate on an acronym called Recio, okay, which uh, worked out uh, what our priorities were as we turned up to that job. And the R stood for rescue, okay? Uh, even if we turned up to that job in the 70s after 10 minutes, okay? It took us 10 minutes to get there. We still had seven and a half minutes before anything was likely to happen. Anything drastic was likely to happen in there. Plenty of time to whip around and have a, a uh, quick primary search of that uh, structure uh, to make sure that there was no victims in there. Now we've got three to four minute. We're lucky, three to four minute flash over time. We're lucky if we get there in under 10 minutes, okay? We sort of aim for that five to eight minute sort of time, I think. So, three to four minutes. Uh, we're lucky if something uh, hasn't happened, a flash over hasn't happened, or is uh, pretty close to happening when we get there. And we'll have a bit of a look at that uh, in the last bit of the presentation. Uh, so that's our fuel. We know that in our homes there's going to be plenty of fuel. Our heat, our fires don't just start on their own, okay? So to begin with, we need an external sort of source of heat, okay? An ignition source. To begin with, the fire's going to be pretty small. There's going to be plenty of oxygen there as well. 
in the beginning we need that ignition source, but what is it that keeps our fire burning after we take that ignition source away? If we light a campfire, we use a cigarette lighter and then we take that away. Okay, but where does the heat come from that keeps that process going, that combustion process going? The flame chemical reaction, which turns our triangle into a tetrahedron. The flame chemical react reaction, often mentioned but never explained. Well, they talk, they mentioned it all the time, the tetrahedron, when I went to the college, but they never really explained what it was. Uh, oxidation. Everyone's heard of oxidation. It's a process that's happening all around us, okay? It's the oxygen in the air uh, reacting with the surfaces around us, okay? Uh, iron, oxygen reacting with the surface of iron, forming iron oxide, okay, or rust. Uh, take a bite out of an apple, the inside of the apple starts to go brown quite rapidly, okay? It's oxidation. It's just happening very, very slowly in those uh, circumstances. But it is an exothermic reaction. Anyone know what exothermic means? It releases energy. Yep, the process releases energy. The opposite of exothermic? Endothermic. Yeah, it requires energy for it to happen. So it's an exothermic reaction. And in the case of our combustion, it's producing a couple of forms of energy, OK? Heat and light. Some of our light is in the visible spectrum. Most of it is infrared. I think there's a bit of ultraviolet as well. Uh, so let's have a look. I'm going to break it down to simplify it a little bit. But uh, when we look at pyrolysis of uh, our modern synthetic materials, we get a lot of uh, CH4, which is methane produced. And it's predominantly the interaction with that pyrolyzed methane and atmospheric oxygen. Okay, that produces, that's the oxi oxidation, oxygen, oxidising that methane, that is producing the energy. But I'm going to simplify it a little bit. So I'll have a look at our fuel. And for my fuel, I'll just use a block of nylon. We know it's not going to start burning on its own. I need that external source of heat, okay, my ignition source. So when I apply heat to the surface of my fuel, the atoms that make up the surface of my fuel, and if you have a look at the solid there, the atoms that make up our solids, they're packed in tightly together, okay? They're only really able to vibrate. It's what gives our uh, solids their rigidity. When I apply heat to those uh, atoms, they begin to vibrate more rapidly. Okay? If I apply enough energy, they'll vibrate so much that they will begin to become unstable. And if they become unstable enough, they'll begin to break free. We call that process pyrolysis. It's just a process of thermal degradation. So this one I'm going to simplify. Instead of CH4, I'm just going to break it down into carbon and hydrogen atoms. When a gas is heated, and you can see our gas there, the atoms that make up our gases, they're separated, okay? They're able to move around quite freely. If I heat a gas up, those atoms move further apart. My gas becomes less dense and more buoyant. It will want to rise. If I heat it up and confine it with a, in a vessel or a compartment, they'll want to uh, spread further apart, but they'll find it difficult. So I'll have an increase in pressure as well. So my pyrolysis gases, are heated, they're more buoyant, they want to rise, but they create an area of lower pressure there as they rise. And that process of convection begins, okay? I have cooler, denser 
air being drawn in. I'm not so much interested in most of my air. 78% of my air is nitrogen. 20.8% oxygen and 1.2% other trace gases. So it's the oxygen I'm interested in. Oxygen in Earth's atmosphere and the same with nitrogen travels around in pairs, okay? So two oxygen atoms. And they're held together by a fairly weak bond. Due to the heat from my ignition source, that bond is broken. So I now have three oxygen atoms mixing with my hydrogen and carbon atoms. That breaking of that bond is exothermic, okay? It releases energy. Again, due to the heat from my ignition source, I have new molecules start to form, okay? What do you think I get when carbon joins with oxygen? Carbon, if I have plenty of oxygen, CO2. If I start to limit the amount of oxygen, more carbon monoxide. Hydrogen and oxygen, I end up with H2O, okay, water. That formation of new molecules, also exothermic, okay, it releases energy. So if we look at that exothermic part of my reaction, that splitting of those oxygen <coughs> atoms, the formation of those new molecules, generates a lot of energy, a lot of heat. A lot of that heat returns back into that combustion process, okay? It comes to rest on my, or lands on my fuel. So I have an increased rate of pyrolysis. More gases produced, more air drawn in. More air drawn in, more carbon atoms, more hydrogen atoms, more oxygen, more oxidation, even more energy generated. Even greater rate of pyrolysis, even more air drawn in. This process, this oxidation process, will continue to grow and provided the three sides of my fire triangle are satisfied, it will grow exponentially and will eventually reach a point where it becomes self-sustaining. So if I remove my ignition source prior to that point being reached, my combustion process will cease, okay? Because my oxidation process is not providing sufficient heat to sustain combustion. If I remove my ignition source after that point has been reached, it will continue, okay? Because now my oxidation, that flame chemical reaction is providing the heat, okay, that is going to sustain that uh, combustion. That makes sense? It's my explanation of the flame chemical reaction. Uh, I might talk about, when it comes to organic fuels, has anyone heard of Thornton's rule? Yeah, Thornton was a guy back in 1917, okay, and he liked to burn things. In particular, organic fuels. What, in the process of burning organic fuels, he noticed that there was a relationship between uh, the amount of energy generated in that combustion process and the amount of oxygen uh, consumed. I'll ask you a question. If I have a lump of plastic in this hand, a lump of wood in that hand, and I'll burn them both just using one kilogram of oxygen in that uh, combustion process, which one do you think will give off the most energy? Plastic. Most people say the plastic, okay? The plastic will consume that oxygen uh, far more rapidly. Burn with a, a lot higher heat release rate. Uh, Burn a lot more intensely. The wood, consume that oxygen a lot more gradually, burn a lot more slowly, okay, a lot lower heat release rate. But what Thornton found was that no matter what organic material he burned, that the amount of energy released, if he used the same amount of oxygen, those organic materials would release the same amount of energy, okay, approximately. And he measured that to be.
13.1 megajoules per kilogram of oxygen. But of course we don't have 100% oxygen in our atmosphere, so we usually use a figure of 3 megajoules per kilogram of air. Uh, for us, that's very useful information, okay? Based on those figures, we can start to make some calculations. If I've got a room 2.4 metres by 3.6 metres by 2.4 metres high, and I'll have a half a megawatt fire burning in that, which is a large armchair burning, half a megawatt fire will consume all the available oxygen in that compartment within a two-minute period, okay? That is valuable information for us as firefighters, okay? Because we know... Now, the effect that oxygen has on that fire, if we can limit the amount of oxygen available to that fire, we're going to limit the growth of that fire. When we educate the public, okay, what do you do if you have a fire in your house, one that you can't immediately control yourself? We encourage them to shut the door on that room of origin, okay, if they can. Shut as many doors as they can on the way out of that uh, structure, gather their kids and whatever <coughs> on the way out, calling triple zero. If we can shut the room on that, the door on that room of origin, okay, we're going to slow the growth of that fire, okay, we're going to uh, keep temperatures down, we're going to slow that heat release rate down, because that exponential growth won't happen, okay, that oxidation, there won't be sufficient oxygen there for it to happen at a very fast rate. If we're looking at three to four minute flash over times, that'll slow down the growth of that fire and give us, who are probably getting there five minutes plus, uh, gives us time to get there and extinguish that fire before it breaches that compartment. It also stops the spread of smoke throughout the structure as well. And that smoke carries a lot of that energy from my oxidation process as well. It's full of those energised particles. Uh, on a larger scale, when it comes to commercial buildings, you can start to look at uh, fuel loads, uh, available oxygen, uh, floor spaces, start to predict likely, likely rates of uh, growth in, that comp in those compartments. Start to design suppression systems based on that knowledge. Uh, so, it's pretty important knowledge to have. We know based on Thornton's rule that probably need a fully open doorway on a room for that room to reach flashover, okay? Because flashover is a heat-driven event, okay? The surfaces, the unburnt surfaces in that room have to get hot enough to reach their auto-ignition temperature. If that doesn't happen, we don't have a flashover, okay? That room can still reach full involvement, okay, just by that fire gradually moving across the room, but we won't have that sudden and sustained transition between a developing fire and a fully developed fire that we call a flashover. Uh, the problem for us as firefighters as well is a bit of a paradox, you know. We know that if we get to that structure and there's a fire burning inside, we know that if we open that door we're going to introduce oxygen, okay, which is going to increase that oxidation process, okay. Temperatures are going to increase, fire activity is going to increase, heat release rates are going to go up. But we have no choice, really. We've got to get in there. And our hose line, because we operate in Cruiser 4, the SOs sending radio messages, <coughs> doing a 360, isolating uh, gas and power. Uh, the motor drivers setting up tri triage area, uh, looking up the BA tally board. Uh, he's getting water in. So we've got two guys. We've got our hose crew. Uh, they're on fire attack. They can't manage that doorway, OK? So as soon as they enter that, Hose is holding that door open and now I've got an opening that big introducing oxygen. So firefighters need to be aware of the effect that that oxygen may have on a ventilation control uh, fire. Uh, so that's Thornton's rule and that's oxidation, the plain chemical reaction. Uh, any questions? Yeah, um, are plastics considered organic materials? Ah uh, yeah, because they're made out of... I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Uh, I've got, it'll take me too long to get the pictures up, but it, it shows the uh, atomic structures, several different types of nylon, uh, the atomic structure of nylon, and it's just a comparison between that and the percentages of the different atoms that make up crude oil, okay? 90, 
95% hydrogen and carbon atoms, there's a bit of nitrogen, I think, and oxygen. Okay, and it's the same, basically the same consistency for our nylons. Yeah. So, yeah, they're organic based anyway. Even though they're synthetic. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, uh, Thornton's rule, not to be confused with the heat of combustion. Okay, the heat of combustion is different. Uh, because if I burn, say, this time instead of a kilogram of air, I have a kilogram of plastic and a kilogram of wood, and I burn them both using an unlimited amount of oxygen, the plastic would certainly uh, give off more energy, okay, during that combustion process. So uh, Thornton's rule is different to the heat of combustion. Uh, okay, no more, no more questions on that? What's that, sir? Oh, no. Once I get on, if I get on a roll, I'm all right. I spend a lot of time looking at the whiteboard, just set on my nerves. Don't disturb him, sir. Okay, what do I have on next? Oh, let's have a bit of a look at the movement of energy around my uh, structure. Let's draw a couple of rooms. So I have my fire burning. And we know that that combustion uh, that flame chemical reaction or the oxidation process that is where all my energy is coming from. A lot of it forms that heat side of my fire triangle but a lot of it rises with the Particles that make up my gases and my smoke. They're heated, they're buoyant, they rise towards the ceiling, okay, where they begin to accumulate. And they'll form that layer that we know as the neutral plane. Eventually, they'll begin to spill out and into the adjoining compartments. So, my smoke and my gases are now carrying a lot of that energy from my oxidation process with them. High pressure always wants to move to low pressure. My gases are at a higher pressure to the uh, air in the adjoining compartment. So my high pressure gases and smoke want to move to an area of low pressure. They're replaced by cooler, denser air being drawn in down low towards the fire. Okay, and that's convection. There's also convection current circulating within that fire compartment as well. In the early stages of the fire, most of the preheating of my surfaces, of those unburnt surfaces, is due to those convection currents, okay? When my fire's a bit smaller, my, I've got a higher neutral plane, most of the heat is being circulated by those convection currents. As my fire grows in size, and as my neutral plane moves lower, we get a lot of infrared radiation off my fire plume radiating downwards from above my neutral plane. My heated compartment boundaries start to flow, uh, throw uh, radiation in as well, infrared. The lower my neutral plane gets, the more intense that radiation becomes. Like any form of radiation, the way that we minimise our exposure to radiation, time, distance and shielding. Okay, so picture yourself in front of a campfire. If I stand too close to that campfire, I get very uncomfortable, I get too hot. Okay, it's because the radiation close to that fire is quite intense. But if I move back a couple of metres, 
all of a sudden I'm in an area that's quite comfortable for me. Because that radiation diminishes quite rapidly as it moves through the air. Because as it moves through the air, those photons are banging into the atoms that make up my air, okay? They're losing energy, they're being refracted, uh, they're being slowed down. I can go and stand really close to that fire for a really short amount of time and then move away and that radiation doesn't have much of an opportunity to ra uh, raise the temperature of my skin. So I limit the time that I'm exposed. I can stick something in front of me and now that radiation can't reach me, okay? Any form of radiation, time, distance and shielding, that's how we minimise our exposure to it. So the lower my neutral plane gets, the more intense that radiation becomes. The bigger my fire gets, the more radiation coming off that fire. So as we're getting closer to flashover, okay, that preheating of my surfaces is now as a result of radiation rather than those convection currents. Uh, so if I have... If I have furniture in the adjoining compartment, what effect do you think that energy is going to have on those surfaces? If I've got nylon carpet, and some forms of nylon uh, start to pyrolyse at about 80 degrees, I'll have pyrolysis begin. Okay, so my furnishings will start to pyrolyse. They're preheating. So if I've got a three to four minute flash over time in this compartment, these adjoining compartments are already being preheated, okay? So if this one flashes over, there'll probably be a more rapid cascading uh, series of flashovers in the adjoining compartments because that preheating process has already begun in those uh, compartments. And these are the compartments that we're moving through as firefighters to put water on this fire, okay? That's why cooling, removing some energy from those gases and that smoke, bringing temperatures down, reducing the amount of thermal energy, reducing the amount of uh, radiation becomes so important to us. Uh, okay, so that's how energy moves around inside our structure. I'm just going to show you a, uh, the only video I'm going to show you. VLC. <laughs> Pick the VLC. And take a bit of take a bit of note of the smoke in the early stages of the fire. What colour it is, okay? The density, volume of smoke on the fuel surface. Smoke is present without flame. Smoldering can sometimes go on for hours before developing into flaming combustion. Although the smoke develops slowly in this phase, given enough time, it can fill a structure and kill occupants before any significant flaming is present. The fire is now progressing into the flame-producing stage. Flaming combustion can only occur when the necessary quantities of heat, fuel, and oxygen are present. Right now, we have a small flame. It is rapidly progressing into a substantial fire. As we noted earlier, the heat from the fire is producing combustible and toxic gases from the burning chair. A smoke detector has been placed just outside the room. The fire has now given off enough smoke to activate the alarm, telling occupants to make an immediate decision. The poignant nature of the gases released from the burning chair causes the flame to spread upward. From the rising flames quickly ignites the draperies on roof of the ceiling. The 
temperature at the ceiling above the chair is now 570 degrees Fahrenheit, 300 degrees Celsius. If a residential sprinkler had been placed eight feet diagonally from the corner, it would now activate, sounding an alarm and discharging water. Fire damage would be confined to the chair and curtains. The buildup of smoke and its toxic gases has now thickened into a hot, dense cloud in only 70 seconds since the first appearance of flame. This mushrooming cloud of hot, thick smoke and gas begins to act like a space heater, radiating heat downward. The paint and wall finishes, the furniture, paper, fabric, wood and plastics in the room are beginning to decompose from the blistering heat. And as they decompose, they contribute to the buildup of toxic and flammable gases. The smoke level continues to descend and is now four feet above the floor. The temperature of the floor has reached 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The huge quantities of smoke have now almost filled the room. The flow of hot air and radiant heat from the layer of smoke have combined to raise the temperature of everything in the room. So the that and other my precious are now so gas is moving down. The cooler air being drawn in down like fresh air. Every flammable object in the room is almost instantaneously ignited. The combustible gases from the decomposing furniture are being consumed by the fire. The room itself is an inferno. So at present, there's a finite amount of oxygen getting in through that open doorway. Okay, so our heat release rate is being governed by the amount of oxygen. Remember when I mentioned uh, some examples of heat release rates earlier on? Smoldering <coughs> cigarette, uh, waste paper basket, uh, living or bedroom fire, 3 to 10 megawatts depending on ventilation, okay? 3 megawatts because the only oxygen getting in is through that open doorway. So that's restricting the energy being given off by that fire. But watch what happens when I there's a panel on the side gate. To a room totally involved in fire. It took only two minutes. Smoke burns too, okay? It's nearly everything, every component of smoke is unburnt fuel, just about, okay? Given the right mixtures, the right temperatures. Uh, Carbon dioxide and other toxic fumes are now being generated in tremendous quantities. The temperature inside the room is 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, 760 degrees Celsius. A room that flashes over becomes like a furnace unable to contain the heat it is generated, unleashing incredible flame, heat, and time. So at present, all that energy, that's just going to atmosphere, okay? Picture that at the end of a hallway in a house. All that energy is pumping through the adjoining compartments. So gas is cool off the building. So now that heat release rate's gone up, okay, because there's far more oxygen getting into that phenomenon than we can talk about. Okay. So if we had a look at a, uh, we'll just go through, we'll have a look at a graph of temperature and time. My fire would look something like that, okay? And it would move through four fairly distinct stages. The first stage is the growth, growing or developing fire. My third stage is that fully developed fire. If I have sufficient oxygen, a sufficiently high enough heat release rate, uh, sufficiently high enough temperatures for that preheating of those surfaces, those unburnt surfaces, uh, get those to their auto ignition temperature so that they light up without coming in contact with that ignition source, okay? That's our flashover. 
which is our second stage. And we call that the sudden and sustained transition between a growing or developing fire and our fully developed fire. fire. Uh, flash over. And then if we don't put the fire out, eventually the fuel begins to be consumed and we move into that decay stage. The example that we had a look at just then, let's have a look at another graph. This time we'll have a look at it in terms of heat and time. So it's basically a heat release rate graph, okay? The amount of heat being released over time. That fire, it certainly flashed over, but then it only had that open doorway, didn't it? So that heat release rate probably plateaued at about, oh, it might have been three megawatts. Okay, and you heard him mention the temperature too. The temperature uh, only got to about, I think he said 760 degrees or something. All of a sudden those glass panels go on the front of that structure. I get more oxygen in. Now my heat release rate, I doubt it got to 10, but probably might have got up to about eight megawatts, okay? And temperatures would have jumped up as well, okay? Might have got up to 1100 degrees Celsius. A Little bit unrealistic because we don't have glass panels on the front of our rooms. But what could have happened is a large window goes in that room as well, okay? Uh, so we've got that fully open doorway. Now we've got that large window going as well. So we can get those uh, large heat release rates. Uh, anything else? If we have a look at, just say, uh, prior to flashover, we close the door on that compartment. Okay, so now we cut off that supply of oxygen. The fire wants to flash over, wants to flash over, but now temperature's <coughs> dropping because of that ox uh, uh, it's been deprived of oxygen. Heat release rate is dropping. So, my temperature begins to fall. Heat release rate would fall as well. And now that big window fails, or we open that door, okay? Now, that fire's got oxygen. Heat release rate increases, temperature increase, increases, and I can have a flashover occur again. We call that a ventilation-induced flashover. If that compartment stays closed and it's fairly airtight, keeps the heat in there, heat release rate, will, uh, temperature will get uh, fairly low, heat release rate will drop right off. What process is going to uh, continue? I need 12% oxygen to sustain flaming combustion, okay? So once I get below 12%, uh, I go back to a smouldering fire. But there's one process that deprivation of oxygen doesn't affect. What do you think that is? Pyrolysis, okay? Pyrolysis will continue. It doesn't matter about the amount of oxygen. As long as it's hot enough in there to pyrolyze surfaces, it will continue to happen, okay? So this is when we start looking at backdraft sort of conditions. I think most backdrafts take a fair bit of time to develop those conditions, backdraft conditions, okay? So it doesn't really fit on the time scale of this graph, okay? Because this flashover, three to four minutes. Whereas that backdraft, it could be developing over a day or two, okay? Uh, yeah, any questions on that? Our I've stages of our. I've got to ask that question yesterday about um, percentage of oxygen that would sustain fire. So you, you said flaming fire, right, at 12%. Yeah. Below 12% oxygen is less than flaming, but it's some degree of smoldering. Yeah, it'll yeah. smolder. Okay. The nether compartment's never going to be free of oxygen because there's oxygen, all our synthetic materials have oxygen in them. So as they pyrolyze, they're releasing certain amounts of oxygen. So it's never free of oxygen, I don't think that compartment. Uh, but yeah, 12%, that percentage varies depending on who you 
it's an absolute nightmare trying to find information online because everyone has a different opinion on everything. Okay, so that percentage, 12%, uh, you click on someone else's site, might be 13%, might be 14%, but usually around that 12, 13 sort of percent uh, oxygen minimum for flaming combustion. Uh, okay, so that's that. How are we going for time? <coughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay, we've got the big part of the presentation is just about to start. The camera will run out in 50 minutes, so you've got 50. <laughs> uh, okay, we've played everything so far. Okay, we'll have a look at our two compartments again. This time, I'm going to furnish my compartment. Might have a single seater lounge, two seater lounge, a bookshelf, maybe a window with some nylon curtains, nylon carpet, synthetic furnishings. Okay, my fire's not going to start on its own. We need that ignition source, okay? So I'm going to say it's a, uh, maybe a faulty uh, phone charge. We have an electrical short. It generates enough heat uh, to get the plastic casing to its auto ignition temperature. It ignites and in turn ignites the side of my single seater lounge. In the beginning, very small fire. Its demands for oxygen are easily met by the oxygen within that compartment and the oxygen coming in through that uh, doorway. Its growth is strictly uh, governed by the available fuel. Okay, It's got plenty of oxygen, so its growth is governed by fuel. We call it fuel control. A good example of a fuel control fire, a campfire. Okay, If I add fuel to that fire, it's going to go grow large. If I take fuel away, it will grow smaller. My fuel control fire. Remember when we had a look at that oxidation process? Uh, what, um, what was being produced as far as gases uh, when I had plenty of oxygen? CO2, CO2 and H2O. Fuel control fire. Burning very, very efficiently, okay? Very little visible smoke in a fuel controlled state, okay? If I do see any smoke, it's probably going to be light, white, and wispy, okay? And it's more than likely that H2O dropping back below 100 degrees and starting to uh, turn into vapor, form tiny little water droplets. Fuel control fire, I'll probably have very little visible smoke. But that won't last very long because as my fire grows, its demands for oxygen grow as well. And pretty soon there's not enough oxygen coming in through that open door <coughs> or in that compartment for that fire to burn 100% efficiently. Okay, its growth is starting to be governed by the amount of available oxygen. It's moving into a ventilation controlled state. And as it does, my smoke begins to change. Now I have a limited amount of oxygen. I have less CO2 and more CO being produced. I also have a cocktail of other gases as well. I'm going to name a few. Uh, hydrogen cyanide. Okay, there's a bit of a tension paid to it overseas. We don't really mention it over here. Okay, they call them the toxic twins. Both asphyxiants, but hydrogen cyanide, uh, it's absorbed by the skin as well, okay, and it's carcinogenic. Uh, it doesn't rate a mention over here, so maybe our fires don't produce it. I doubt that. So, uh, CO, HCN, uh, it's burning it efficiently, so I'm getting unburnt pyrolysis uh, products. So, one of my gases produced by pyrolysis is CH4, okay, methane. So, I'm getting a lot of methane in those uh, gases as well. 
Uh, another gas, uh, CH2O. This gets talked about all the time, formaldehyde, okay? Whenever anyone comes out to London Derry, we burn chipboard uh, in the containers out there. And people worry about formaldehyde being released during that combustion process. And yes, it does get released, but it's also released in just about everything else that burns, okay? You go to a bushfire, there's probably formaldehyde in the smoke, and yet we stand in a bushfire with the dust mask on for hour after hour after hour sucking smoke in, okay? There's probably a lot of harmful gases in that smoke, so I wouldn't be doing it personally. Uh, CH2O, here's another one, C6H6, benzene, okay, again, really, really nasty, okay, but it's only a combination of carbon and hydrogen atoms, okay, it's just the way the fire burns, whatever's pyrolysing, whatever's uh, being consumed in that combustion process is producing different gases, okay, another one, uh, Another really toxic gas, carcinogenic. <clears throat> so when I look at my smoke, these are the non-visible components of my gas. Okay, they're all colourless gases. Okay, I can't see them. But they occupy space. They give my smoke volume. What about the visible components of my smoke? Uh, less oxygen, I'm getting a lot more free carbon atoms floating around. Those carbon atoms are starting to clump together. Unburnt carbon. Unburnt carbon particles. And we know that as soot. And that's what gives my smoke that black colour. Okay, we get unburnt pyrolysis products. A lot of my pyrolysis products are gaseous. You get hydrogen, uh, CO2, CO, uh, methane, uh, H2O. But we also get, uh, when objects pyrolyze, we get aerosol or small droplets of hydrocarbon. Which we call tar. And that's that oily residue. We get it on the tops of helmets and over everything, over the inside of the containers because we uh, rely heavily on pyrolyzing those boards to create uh, smoke. Uh, wherever you've got a lot of timber present, you'll get a lot of tar in that uh, pyrolysis product. And that gives our smoke a brownie colour. Uh, we also get some uh, ash and other bits of, other fragments of, uh, unburnt material rising up because there's quite a strong convection current rising above that fire now. So this is our visible part. This is what gives our smoke its density, okay? But just because we can't see these gases, they're still making up the volume of that smoke. So my smoke, my combustion process getting less efficient, producing more of these products. My smoke is starting to darken up, okay? It's producing a lot more soot. It's rising to the ceiling, forming that neutral plane, okay? What we know is a neutral plane. The neutral plane is the visible interface between uh, my overpressure, what I can see, my smoke, and what I can't see, my underpressure, okay? But just because I can't see anything underneath that neutral plane doesn't mean that there's nothing there, okay? It's air, it's nitrogen, it's oxygen. It's occupying space. So there's a struggle for space between what I can see above and what I can't see below. So that's quite a turbulent region. Uh, so my smoke's accumulating. There's a big difference between my smoke here and my smoke there. What do you think that is? And I mentioned it earlier. 
It's got more to do with flammability. Yeah. All this shit burns, okay? This is non-flammable. This is really, really flammable, okay? And I might just, when we have a look at our gases, touch on flammable range. A scale, okay? This end of my scale, 100% air. 0% flammable gas. This end of my scale, 1% or 0% air, 100% flammable gas. All our flammable gases will have what we call a flammable range, okay? And its flammable range lies somewhere between its lower explosive limit and its upper explosive limit. Somewhere in between those two points we'll have what's called the ideal mixture. And if you wanted a definition of the ideal mixture, it's where the flame will propagate through that mixture at its most rapid, okay? So it will burn in the shortest amount of time, releasing that uh, energy in the shortest amount of time. If we move this side of my ideal mixture, we call it a rich mixture. This side, we call it a lean mixture. The further I move away from my ideal mixture, the longer that flame's going to take to propagate or spread through that mixture, okay? It's going to re release that energy over a longer period of time. The flame colour for my ideal mixture is going to be a blue colour flame, okay? The further I get away, it's going to go a yellowy or orange colour. I'll talk about flame colours in a moment. Uh, this side of my lower explosive limit, I am too lean for ignition to occur. I've got too much air, not enough flammable gas in the mixture. This side of my upper explosive limit, I am too rich for ignition to occur. Too much flammable gas, not enough air. It won't ignite. What happens if I open a door on my too lean mixture? More Nothing, easy. does it? It'll just further lean out. Okay. However, if I open a door on a too rich mixture, I've got to worry about that because all of a sudden that mixture can start to lean out and perhaps fall back into its flammable range. Okay, so that's flammable range. Two ways my flammable gas is going to ignite if it's in its flammable range. I either present it with an ignition source, which it'll ignite at any temperature then. Or I can heat that mixture up until it reaches what's called its auto-ignition temperature. At that point, it will ignite whether there's an ignition source present or not. That uh, auto-ignition temperature, as does flammable range, varies from gas to gas. Acetylene has a very wide flammable range. Whereas natural gas has a very narrow flammable range. Different gases also have different auto-ignition temperatures. Carbon monoxide is the only one I can think of. is about 609 degrees Celsius. If I get that mixture to 609 degrees, it'll just light up with no ignition source. Okay, so really flammable, non-flammable. Okay, so now I've got highly energised flammable material moving around my structure. My fire's burning very inefficiently, but there's still enough oxygen for that fire to grow. But it continues to get less and less efficient and produce more of this material. My neutral flame begins to fall and that smoke spills out into the adjoining compartments. Again, high pressure, moving to low pressure. Highest pressure at ceiling height. Highest temperature at ceiling height. Lowest temperature at floor level. Lowest pressure at floor level. Convection currents. Cooler, denser air being drawn in down low towards my fire. What 
What happens here? Just say this is the door to outside of my structure. Let's say this was a kitchen a lot, and this was this was the lounge room here with a lounge in it. Might be the smoke coming off my fire is now thick and black, okay? It's uh, a heavily ventilation controlled fire. The smoke being produced is thick and black, but now it's moving through adjoining compartments. It might pass through several compartments before it exits that front door or that back door. While it's moving through those compartments, there's a lot of heat in those compartments. So I have pyrolysis happening. My pyrolysis products are lighter in colour, okay? They're thick, they're white, they're yellowish or brownish in colour, depending on what's pyrolysing, but they are lighter in colour. So now I might have several rooms of pyro pyrolysing uh, furniture adding to that thick black smoke. So by the time that thick black smoke exits the front door, it might have lightened up a bit because now it's being diluted by those pyrolysis products. Okay, I might have thick dark grey smoke or I might have thick lighter grey smoke. Still going to be very, very thick energetic smoke, okay? It's still going to be full of all this stuff, but now it's mixed with pyrolysis products as well. Maybe this window fails and I've got thick black smoke now, or black smoke coming out that window. So if I turn up at that job, I might have lighter coloured smoke or dark grey smoke, uh, thick light grey smoke chugging out that front door, but I might have black smoke at the back of the house, okay? So that might give me an indication of where that fire might be burning. That thick black smoke is coming off that fire. If that fire dies down and starts smouldering, no more thick black smoke, okay? Because a smouldering fire is producing white smoke, mainly H2O and carbon monoxide. Flaming combustion. So if I've got thick black smoke at that back of the house, then perhaps that gives me an indication of where that fire might be located. If I have a roof on this structure, which I probably will have, that ceiling buoy, that heat, hottest it, well, it could be considerably hot in there, it might be about 500, 600 degrees at ceiling height. A lot of heat being conducted through that chip rock, okay? Now my timber's pyrolyzing up in the roof. Okay, my ceiling buoy starts to fill with those lighter colour pyrolysis products. And that starts leaking out from underneath the tiles. So I could have a few different colours of smoke when I turn up to that job. And they're all telling me something different about what's happening within that uh, structure. At present I've got a neutral plane, but if that front door was shut, what's going to happen is the air underneath my neutral plane is going to heat up, it's going to gain in pressure. Those convection currents are just going to mix that smoke with the air and I'm going to end up with no neutral plane. I'll end up with smoke all the way down to the floor. But as soon as my fire is open that front door, high pressure is going to move to low pressure. It's going to start chugging out that door. Fresh air is going to start to uh, be drawn in. So my neutral plane will start to form from the floor upwards. Uh, we try and encourage firefighters to keep down low. Uh, I'll go through the several reasons for keeping down low, okay? They're no-brainers, and yet firefighters still walk into structures. Stability. I am so stable down low, particularly with a BA on my back. My centre of gravity is down low. Uh, Hottest at ceiling height cause the floor level. The difference in temperature between my head here and my head at standing height could be considerable. Could mean the difference between me being able to reach that fire and put water on it and me being driven out by the heat. Uh, visibility, my neutral plane's gonna start lifting from the floor up, okay? So this is where my visibility is going to be. Where are my victims gonna be? They're either fallen down through lack of oxygen or they've gotten down on the floor because it's the coolest place to be as well. They might be up on a bed, but they sure as shit are floating around up here where I'm going to find them walking around. I can throw a leg out and cover a really wide area of floor as I move forwards in that structure while I'm searching, okay? Still maintain contact with the wall if I need to. 
uh, feel high enough up for door handles and that sort of thing. If the ceiling's been compromised at all, I've got electrical cables dangling down, that metal spiral out of uh, air conditioning flexors. If you get hooked up on that stuff, it's very difficult to extricate yourself. I've been hooked up before just with it wrapped around my BA cylinder in really good visibility and do you think I could get myself loose? No, you can't. It hooks up and you try to pull yourself loose but it just ends up dragging that cable out of the ceiling with you. It's very, very difficult. Imagine that in low visibility, okay? A lot less likely to happen if I'm down uh, low. No reason to be walking around up high, okay? Very little reason, apart from my knees are hurting. And that's not really good enough uh, reason uh, for not keeping down low. So several reasons to be down low, none for walking around uh, up high. So my fires have arrived at this front door. Okay, maybe that door's shut. Uh, they've got zero visibility. What can they use, do you think, to find the fire? Tip. The tip, the thermal imaging camera. Hopefully they've got it with them, okay? Those convection currents, they're very, very visible, okay? Not so much in a area with a higher ceiling, a factory unit or a Bunnings, those convection currents will be lost up high. But in a uh, house with a standard height ceiling or an area with a standard height ceiling, those convection currents are very visible. As soon as I open that door, high pressure is going to start moving to low pressure. Running along that ceiling, those convection currents will look like a stream and they'll be running away from the fire outside to that area of low pressure. It's like swimming upstream. I can follow those to find my fire. So my fire is have entered. They've gone through their door entry procedure. And we have a certain door entry procedure that we go, go through. Uh, they're moving forward. So they're using long pulses. My short pulse is for cooling that area directly around me. But because of those convection currents, if I cool just above me, that area is whipped away quite rapidly. So I want to start, if I'm moving forward, think about cooling out in front of me, cooling that area that I'm moving into. And that's where my long pulse uh, comes in handy. Again, it's just water droplets, but I'm putting them out in front of me rather than directly above. So my fire is in up. There's a couple of non-negotiables, okay? They've got a charge hose line with them, obviously. They've got to keep down low. They've got to control conditions, okay, gas cooling. And they've got to get water on that fire as rapidly as possible. And nice too is to be able to control that flow path. But as I said, that's difficult. We don't have enough hands uh, to do that. If they're on fire attack, if they come across a victim, they're not going to ignore that victim. They've got to get that person out. But what's really, really important is they've been tasked with fire attack. So that's what the IC thinks they're doing. If they find a victim and they uh, need to get that victim out, they need to let the IC know that they're no longer looking for that fire. He needs to retask someone else to do it. So my fire, fire is they've made their way through the adjoining compartments and they've arrived at the door to this room. I know this room is getting pre pretty close to flash hour, okay? It's probably got temperatures five to 600 degrees. at ceiling height. Heat flux this is something I forgot to mention before. Heat flux is the, a measurement of the amount of energy landing upon our surfaces. Okay, uh, It's measured in watts, so the amount of joules per second landing on a surface. Uh, for a flash over to occur, what I need at floor level is about 20, I think it's 20 kilowatts per metre squared. Of energy. That's how much energy I need landing on my unburnt surfaces to get them hot enough for them to flash over. So my fire is, uh, have arrived at the door. There's some signs of flash over. What do you think some of those signs of flash over might be? That's one of the finals. If I see fingers of flame at ceiling height,
That's my gas is starting to ignite. And we've been trying to discourage the use of torches too in low visibility. Uh, we find it all the time in the props out at London, Jerry. The guys come in, uh, we've got these stupid little lights on our helmets that they turn on with no gloves on. But then you can't turn them off, or they're very difficult to turn back off once you've got your gloves on. So once they're in there, if they're a hindrance, they're stuck with them. Uh, they put their torches on. Low visibility, all it does is create a halo around them, okay? They can't see anything outside of that halo of light. It makes them feel safe because they can see their hands and they can see the hose, but they can't see anything outside of that halo of light. They sure aren't going to see those fingers of flame at ceiling height and they're not going to see that glow coming off the fire, okay? Some of those signs we're looking for in order to locate uh, that fire or of impending doom. So fingers of flame at ceiling height. What about my neutral plane? <coughs> Where do you think that's going to be? It's going to be low, isn't it? So I'm going to have a low neutral plane. And that neutral plane is going to be very turbulent. And as demonstrated by that video we watched with that compartment with the glass panels on the front, it was surging in and out with that opening. It's like it was breathing. So that neutral plane will probably billow as well. In regards to the neutral plane, if I was moving through these compartments towards the fire and suddenly that neutral plane lifted, what might that indicate to me? Yeah. Maybe I've had a big window fail or maybe uh, part of that roof has uh, failed, okay, and allowed a lot of that smoke to rise. It might be of uh, immediate benefit, but it's now going to be oxygen getting to that fire. So it's going to intensify those fire conditions. Uh, so low neutral plane. If my neutral plane is low, and we talked about radiation before, what do you think the effect of that is going to be? It's going to intensify that, isn't it? Because the lower my neutral plane gets, the more intense my radiation is going to be. So surface, surfaces are going to be intensely hot. I'll have an increased rate of pyrolysis. The atmosphere is going to be very, very hot as well. So just intensely hot in general. The problem with our protective clothing now, like our uh, turnout gear, we're so well insulated, okay, that uh, we don't feel that heat until it's a little bit too late. Uh, I heard it described the other day, our uh, protective gear, it's not a shield, it's like a heat sink. So what it does is it absorbs that energy before it reaches us, but it's only got a finite ability to do that. Once it's absorbed uh, enough energy, and once it starts getting to me, the only way I'm going to cool down is to get out to an area of uh, lower temperature, okay? So it's really good in one respect, but you know those old telltale signs that the older forests talk about, probably you Dave, mate. The burning the of the ears there. The old ruts, the, the, the the old ruts. Put them up. We can't do that anymore because our gear protects us so well, some of these signs we might not get. Uh, it's still going to be a ventilated fire. Okay, so I'm still going to have visible flame. And that flame is going to be yellow in colour, or if it's a really oxygen deprived atmosphere, uh, moving towards an orangey, orangey colour. Uh, it's what we call a diffuse flame. Uh, the other flame type, uh, pre-mixed. Remember the Bunsen burner? Had that hole in the stem with the hole open. It allowed enough air to get in to mix with that gas to get it as close to its ideal mixture as it uh, possibly could. Uh, so it burnt very, very efficiently. The colour of that flame was a blue flame. 
Now if you shut that uh, cover, cover that hole, now the oxygen is being drawn into that flame uh, from the surrounding atmosphere. Okay, it's burning inefficiently. It's a yellow flame. It's a diffuse flame. Uh, it's same as a candle flame. Okay, so there are our signs of flashover. Our fireys might not get any of those. Okay, they might not. If they've got really, really limited visibility, they might not get any of these. Okay, our fireys might not be even sophisticated enough to recognise those signs. This is why it's so important that fireys, if they have, if they have uh, thick smoke coming out of that front door, it's hot. It's a sign of a. Uh, a active ventilation control fire, okay, and they've got to take precautions. They've got to gas cool, they've got to keep down low, they've got to find that fire as rapidly as possible. The techniques, like the gas cooling techniques we teach, they're probably for that one in a hundred job, okay. It's probably not necessarily to do it all the time, but your average firefighter doesn't have the ability to read signs. You know, turn up at the job and go, you know, I think that's that one in a hundred job, mate we better gas cool. So we encourage them to gas cool at every job they go to if there's that thick smoke coming out that door. Uh, okay, so that's uh, flash over. I think that's about it. Flammable range, and work, video. That might be it. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Close yeah. 10 minutes. That's it. That's it. It just finished. That's it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there's no wind up. Oh, come on. Is there any? And in summary, it's been yeah. In summary, it, no, it's been it's been a real treat being here. Tonight. You've been a a, a, a pleasure to speak in front of. Um, yes, yeah, I'm really nervous to start off with, but I certainly warm warm to the crowd. Thank you very much for having me. I think if I had a, a high school science teacher like this in front of me, I would have gone like the hammer to see uh, that. So was a boy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's so clear and precise the way uh, Tim explained it all. I think we all basically knew that, but to hear it from that step-by-step -step progression and explanation is a fantastic revision. So what happens in this circumstance? When we get a really good presenter, we open the paint, and we get this fantastic Oh, well. <laughs> but if they're really, really good, thank you very much. We also get a bottle of uh, wine. Uh, so, no, it doesn't matter. No, that was. No, 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 it's only it's if they're really, really good. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It does matter. <laughs> get, get the wine. Otherwise, I take it home and no one wants that. And that's not happening. <laughs> oh, well, my wife will love it. <laughs> <laughs> it won't last long enough for me. Mate, thanks so much. We no really worries. appreciate your time. <laughs> And in just summing up, thanks a lot for attending as our final education night for the year, our biggest in a long time, so that's excellent. And for those on the YouTube channel, uh, next year, no, planning another six education nights, our first one in February, and we will be announcing that. February 1? Yes. February 1. Sonia, first Thursday? Uh, Sonia, yeah. Yeah. Sonia's, uh, we had to revise it, Sonia, but we've got a forensic uh, analytical science service person coming along. <laughs> if we can locate that person, she will <laughs> She is turning up. up. We'll, we'll talk among the committee, but Bob, your, uh, your, your, little, your little tool that you've got, uh, you're in the field analysis. Yes. Po possibly we'll, we'll, and possibly yeah, we'll uh, you know, we can get a, a brief explanation of what it is, what it costs, what it's expected to do, and then through the year, maybe we'll get some updates. Yeah. If but you cool. people have any ideas, or if you have any ideas, contact us, contact Steve, and uh, put a, your idea forward for an education night. We'd love to hear from you. Yes. Just before we end, I know that some of you here have not signed in. <laughs> Please sign in because when you want verification you've been here and your name is not on the list, I'm not going to give it to you. So lists are up there. There's about six of you. Please go and sign in. That's got to be your name, not someone else. Merry Christmas. Uh, be safe over the holidays and uh, keep doing good work. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <coughs>